Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy divine love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. And the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, by the light of the Holy Ghost, hast instructed the hearts of thy faithful, grant us by the same spirit, to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolations of the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Sorrowful and Immaculate Heart of Mary, Saint Joseph, Saint Philip and James, Saint Saint Raphael, Pray and with the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. We continue the study of the Sacred Catechism. In this, in this catechism, we are covering the First Commandment. What is the first commandment? Everyone knows this, should know it, but it's the most important commandment, and God himself put it as a priority, which is, what is the first commandment of God? The first commandment of God is, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. The first commandment forbids idolatry, that is, offering to a creature the supreme worship due to God alone given to a creature what is only due to God. Idolatry is sinful because God alone has a right to supreme adoration as the creator and preserver of all things. The first commandment also forbids us to, dis to ascribe to a creature any of the attributes that belong to God alone. <coughs> so this is why it's sinful to seek horoscopes, to seek uh, palm readers, to seek fortune tellers, giving to creatures what only God knows, and playing games like Ouija boards and uh, tarot cards. These things are serious mortal sins against the first commandment. <coughs> Thou shalt not have strange gods before me, which includes Allah, which includes Protestant denominations because they twist Christ's words. They interpret the Bible to their own destruction. So any false gods, um, Buddha, the gods of the millions of gods of the Hindus, these are all false gods. Thou shalt not make to thyself a graven thing, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, nor of those things that are in the waters and under the earth. So God doesn't want any statues or any trees worshipped as God. That's why Saint Boniface chopped down the trees of the god of Thor for the Germans and jumped on the stump holding the cross, preaching to them the true cross, the true God. Same with St. Martin de Poor. He cut down a tree of the pagans, and they said, if your God's true, make it fall to the other side. St. Martin of Tours commanded that it go to the other side. It flipped up and fell the other direction. So, obviously the Protestants love to take this quote and misquote it and say, well, see, you can't have images <clears throat> you can't have statues because those are graven things. And that's just pure <coughs> It's a stupid argument because in the Old Testament, God commands himself to care of angels to be put on the Ark of the Covenant. <clears throat> God commands images. And there's images in the, the Holy of Holies, in the, the, the Temple of Solomon, that God commands. So it's the worship of stone or metal or paints that God forbids. But obviously, uh, anyone has pictures of your wife, pictures of your family, pictures of those you love, because you don't worship the picture, but it reminds you of them. So when the Virgin Mary, the Blessed Trinity gave us a picture of the Virgin Mary, this comes right from the hand of God, of his mother. So God who commands no graven images to worship, gave us a, an image of the Virgin Mary to honor. And there's this distinction that the Protestants often forget. Lot, there, there are three distinctions of adoration, of worship. Cultus, in the Latin word cultus, which means worship. The highest of worship and adoration is only given to God. This is called latria. 
And idol idolatry is idolatria, is giving to a creature what belongs only to God. Latria is the supreme adoration only given to God and to nobody else. So Catholics, we do not give to the Virgin Mary the adoration of Latria. It is not hers, and she knows it. That's why in this beautiful image of the Tilma of Guadalupe, our Lady's head is bowed because she's not God. Her head is bowed to God. Her hands are folded in supplication to God. And But she's not just one of the ordinary angels or saints either because she's blocking the sun. She is standing on the moon. She is truly the woman of the Apocalypse, chapter 12. The woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. So, statues and images, God has always approved and blessed because many statues have cried human tears. Especially in recent times, the statues of the Virgin Mary, scientists have studied it, they can't explain it, but they are crying human tears. And it's been increasing in the last 30 years. And one of the Virgin Mary statues in Italy, she cries human blood tears. Blood. Which shows the Virgin Mary is weeping because so many souls are going to hell and losing the true Catholic faith. So, Latria is only given to God. Dulia is the veneration given to saints. So it's not the same adoration and, and veneration given to God. Dulia means the it's, a, it's the highest respect to saints. And we pray to them who are in heaven to intercede for us to help us get to heaven. They're our big brothers and sisters to help us get to heaven. And it's a great joy and a consolation for Catholics to know we can turn to St. Anthony to help us find lost things. To St. Joseph to help be a good father. St. Joseph to help Mother Church get back on her feet and guide the church through the storm <coughs> of apostasy and confusion, and fake resistance, and compromise, and fuzzy language, <clears throat> and all this. St. Joseph protects the truth, because he protected the child Jesus in the flight to Egypt. St. Joseph is also the terror of demons, and the patron of a happy death. So we have all these great saints to turn to. St. Teresa, St. Augustine, St. Saint Catherine of Siena, St. Pius X and uh, millions and millions of saints who are our big brothers and sisters. That's why it's a Catholic custom to name our children after saints so they have a patron in heaven. And Catholics should not be falling for this pagan custom of naming their children Thunder or Ocean or weird names like, like Crispy and who knows, they, they're coming out with the strangest names and there's no saints named after these strange names. People want to be inventive, but what could be more inventive than naming saints who have attained the happiness of heaven already and can intercede for us? So you want to name your children after saints. So what about hyperdulia? Hyperdulia is an honor which is given to a person higher than all the saints and angels, but not equal to God. And who is this? Who is this? It's the most supreme and venerable and beautiful Virgin Mary. She is not God, but she is higher than all the saints. God has elevated her above all the saints and above all the angels. He wants the Virgin Mary honored. And Protestants say, well, no, he doesn't because da 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 the Bible says this, Bible says that. Well, read the Bible correctly. Solomon wanted his mother honored on his right side, and crowned her queen before all of Israel to salute and venerate his mother. Was she the king? No. Was she the mother? Yes. And he wanted supreme honor given to his mother. And that prefigures Christ, who crowns his mother in heaven and has her really close to him. And so he gives, he's the one who raises her, to that veneration of hyperdulia, which Catholics have always given to the Virgin Mary. And as the seer in La Salette, Melanie, said, there is nobody in the fires of hell, no one in hell,
can be found who had a great devotion to the Virgin Mary. Nobody. <coughs> there are no sons and daughters of the Virgin Mary who loved her and venerated her, <coughs> who wore her scapular, who prayed her rosary, who are in hell. They don't, they're not there. She snatched them from hell. So the first commandment, the highest adoration given to God, the one true God in the three divine persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. <coughs> What are we commanded by the first commandment? By the first commandment we are commanded to offer to God alone the supreme worship that is due to him, Latria. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is written, The Lord thy to, to the devil's temptations, Luke chapter 4. And Christ said, The Lord thy God shalt thou adore, and him only shalt thou serve. And then, how do we worship God, says the Catechism? <clears throat> we worship God by acts of faith, hope, charity, and by adoring Him and praying to Him. And the highest action, the highest act of faith, hope, and charity, and adoration and prayer is the, the prayer of the Supreme High Priest, Jesus Christ, offering Himself to the Father, on the cross. This is the supreme prayer, the most pleasing prayer to God. The sweet incense before Him is His Son on the cross. And what is the Catholic Mass that, that will, makes this present again for real on the altar? That's why the highest adoration and prayer to God is the holy <coughs> sacrifice of the Mass. Said by a, a, a duly ordained priest, according to the correct rite of the Mother Church, and for the Roman rite, that is the Tridentine Mass. <coughs> and any other rite other than the Tridentine Mass, uh, the, 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 the new Mass, for example, is a schismatic rite. It has no blessing from Mother Church. It is not legitimately promulgated, as Bishop Follet sadly agrees to. <coughs> and um, that many uh, of the fake resistants are saying that this schismatic Mass gives grace. It doesn't. It's not a part of the Catholic Church. It's a total fabrication. It's a total invention from the Freemasonic Lodge, written by Cardinal Bonini, Archbishop Bonini, who himself admitted. Read the recusant for April 2017. There's a lot of good information there. And he quotes Archbishop Lefebvre. And he quotes Bishop Bonini who says, we deliberately took out of the new Mass everything that would be offensive to Protestants. And that's gutting out the Mass. And you can't, there's no way this Mass gives grace, it's schismatic, it's, it's, it's not a rite of the Catholic Church. And that's why any priest who says it knowingly or participates in it, he, depending on the degree of knowledge, he at least objectively commits a mortal sin of false worship. So, what are we? We worship God by faith, hope, charity, and adoring Him and praying to Him. The next question of the Catechism, a very important. What does faith oblige us to do? So this should be an easy one for all of us. We should be living this. First, to make efforts to find out what God has revealed. Second, to believe firmly what God has revealed. Thirdly, profess our faith openly whenever necessary. So first, to make efforts to find out what God has revealed. Just think how much time people spend on looking up information off the internet, looking up sports information, who's winning the teams, and who's in the World Series, who's in the Stanley Cup, who's going to win the Super Bowl. Hours and hours and hours. And just think of the hours people devote <coughs> religiously to entertainment. Hours and hours to entertainment. Movies, <coughs> video games, getting video games, shopping. And yet, we're going to say goodbye to all this. And if these things become before God, we are breaking the first <coughs> man. We have to make every effort to find out the truth. Know our catechism. And read the lives of the saints who are the living catechism. 
No, the first catechism written by the Apostles, which is the Gospels, St. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How many Catholics are ignorant of the basic Gospels? And it's not Protestants who were the first to encourage reading the Scriptures. The Catholic Church has always granted privileges and indulgences for reading the Scriptures. Pope Leo XIII granted a plenary indulgence to those who will read 15 minutes of Scriptures every day under the usual conditions. <coughs> so uh, we have to be thirsty to fill our mind with truth, to hear sermons, catechisms, to read them, and we should always devote some time in everyone's day, starting as soon as you can read, as soon as you can listen, because faith first comes by hearing. And how many of us are grateful to our first hearing the faith through the harmonious rhythm of the rosary and the family rosary, as, it, as in as babies running around, the whole family's praying the rosary, and that memory of that Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour. You, you hear it. The faith penetrates. And to hear the first teachings of the faith from the mouth of your mother, who teaches you the sign of the cross, and the name of Jesus, the name of Mary, these things are very powerful. And the voice of the Father teaching the catechism, reading the scriptures at home for the whole family. This should be normal in every home. So, we have to devote time to know what God taught us. Secondly, we've got to believe everything God has revealed, like children. Unless you become like children, Christ said, you will not, will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So we've got to believe all that God has revealed, like children. Thirdly, profess the faith openly whenever necessary. We should never be afraid to make the sign of the cross in McDonald's, in public restaurants, when we say grace before and after meals. We should never be ashamed. And I remind you, as I remind always the youth who might be embarrassed to make the sign of the cross and be made fun of, well look at these professional soccer players. They're on international TV. When they score a goal, they have no shame making the sign of the cross. And I understand there's pressure now on these soccer players to stop making the sign of the cross. So it's an act of faith. And they have no fear nor embarrassment to make the sign of the cross before the whole world to thank God for their goal. And we're, we, the children of God, the militants of Christ's army, are ashamed to make the sign of the cross? Or think of it this way. How many people, Americans, do you see wearing proudly the jersey of Chicago Cubs? or New York Islanders, or um, Montreal Canadiens, or uh, Dallas Cowboys. People proudly wear their hats, their insignia of their team. There's no embarrassment. Why is there embarrassment to wear the greatest insignia, the sign of the cross of the divine king, the king over all kings? And those teams are all going to fade away. But God doesn't fade away, so we must love the sign of the cross, profess the faith. And when people ask you, says St. Peter, give an answer for the hope that is in you. Many people that will question you, why are you wearing that strange thing around your neck, scapular? Why do you have a rosary hanging in your car? Why do you make the sign of the cross at meals? And people will ask and give an answer. Because what you answer may opt for that particular soul... God may have arranged it for that soul to meet you. And on your answer may depend his eternal damnation or salvation. Think about that. Listen to um, the words of our Lord. Therefore, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I, in turn, will disown him before my Father in heaven. Matthew 10, 32. And here's the exact reason why we have to reject Vatican II in the New Mass. It disowns Christ as God, as eternal high priest, as the only Savior, and as the true King. And the first commandment forbids our second amendment. Our second amendment says, in the United States, that Congress shall make no laws pertaining to religion. 
It'll be neutral on matters of religion. And this breaks the first commandment. It gives rights to all false gods. And that is a horrible sin against the first commandment. That's why as Catholics, we must never rest with these false principles, but always strive and pray and work for the social reign of our Lord Jesus Christ <coughs> over the whole United States and over the whole world. That His name be in our Constitution, and that His Holy Roman Catholic Church of tradition, not this Vatican II nonsense and the conciliar church of Vatican II. That, that's a false church, but the real church of the Catholic faith, that's what should be on our Constitution. And that's true freedom, because the truth will make you free, not these false religions. How much freedom do all these aborted babies have, who are maybe six months, four months, even nine months in their mother's womb, and then are ripped out right out of, the, out of their mother's womb by abortion, in the name of women's rights, in the name of man's rights, in the name of freedom. And what kind of freedom is that? for that little child, and even for the mother who afterwards hears the screaming for the rest of her life in nightmares, and is never forgets that sin of abortion. They never forget it. It haunts them their whole life. And if they don't repent and turn back to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, who will always forgive, they will hear that screaming forever in hell. So, um, just think, Protestantism permits divorce, contraception, and uh, praises fornication, depending on how you interpret your Bible. And Mormons permit polygamy and uh, insult Christ by saying that he's the brother of Lucifer. And all these false religions permit immorality. Protestant Henry VIII, the founder of Anglicanism, founded his religion on divorce. Who wants to be longer a religion that is founded on a mortal sin against God? Divorce. While well, Christ forbids divorce. So all the false religions permit immorality and permit all false thinking. Only the Catholic truth frees us by protecting the woman in marriage, by protecting the virginity of the girls before marriage, by protecting the baby in her mother's womb, by protecting the openly by our example and by words. A Catholic is bound to profess his faith openly. First, whenever the honor due to God requires it. For example, when his failure to profess his faith openly would be equivalent to a denial of the faith. Second, when the good of his neighbor requires it. So, and then uh, the faith, and then the hope of, obliges us. What does hope oblige us to do? Hope obliges us to trust firmly that God will give us eternal life and the means to obtain it. So we must hope in the goodness of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. He gave us His mother on the cross. John, behold thy mother. Son, behold thy mother. She's our mother. So our great hope is in her because she snatches so many from hell. So have a great hope in the love and mercy of God, the sacred heart of Jesus, and the pure and immaculate heart of Mary. And what does charity oblige us to do? Charity obliges us to love God above all things because He is infinitely good and to love our neighbor as ourselves for the love of God. So charity, this is a big question, it would probably need a catechism just by itself. But suffice it to say, we must love God above all and our neighbor for the love of God. Let's touch a little bit now on what this first commandment primarily deals with, the faith. How can a Catholic best safeguard his faith? A Catholic can best safeguard his faith by making frequent acts of faith. This is why every day we need to make the acts of faith, the acts of the Apostles' Creed which repeat the basics of the faith, because we need to be reminded, again, what St. John Vianney said, to keep the faith for your children, God's name, and the faith must be mentioned at least two or three times every day in the home. By preparing for a strong faith, by studying his religion very earnestly, by living a good life, 
by good reading, by refusing to associate with the enemies of the church, and by not reading books and papers opposed to the church and her teaching. That's why in the great old, great old days, the church used to have the Inquisition, the church, which is a good thing, by the way, and uh, in a very just and merciful court system. Uh, all the bishops would censure the movies and the books that were printed. And this was up in the 50s, even into the 60s. So if, a bish if the bishop said this movie is immoral, this movie is against the faith, the Catholics wouldn't go to it. So Hollywood would lose out. The Judeo-Masons in Hollywood had to make movies that were not censured if they wanted to make money. And that's when bishops, more or less, used to be good bishops, at least on the moral level. How can a, so how does a Catholic sin against the faith? Very important, this question, because we're swimming in all these sins now. A, a Catholic sins against the faith first by apostasy, which is to abandon the Catholic faith altogether. Second, heresy, which is to pick and choose, on the Greek word which means, I choose. So Protestants, Protestantism is a heresy. Calvinism, and all the denominations. They're all heresies because they pick, oh, I, I believe in Jesus as God, but I don't believe that He gave the Holy Eucharist. I believe Jesus gave us baptism, but I don't believe He gave us the sacrament of confirmation and extreme unction and the priesthood. So they pick and choose. And when it comes to Revelation, we have no right to pick and choose. We must submit. St. Paul says the faith is a submission, an obedience to what God has revealed. So, heresy, which we swim in, Vatican II has over 200 heresies in it. The, ma the new Mass swims in heresy. And then uh, the third sin against the faith is indifferentism. Indifferentism is defined as, and condemned by Pius IX and Gregory XVI, as the a delirium, as the worst of offenses. St. Augustine says, quoted by Pope Gregory XVI in his encyclical Merari Vos, he says, What death more fatal for souls than the liberty of error? Think about that. What death more fatal for souls than the liberty of error, than the freedom to believe what you want? Indifferentism is the error of those who hold that one religion is as good as another and that all religions are equally true and pleasing to God and that one is free to accept or reject any or all religions. So, the great Pope Leo XIII said, Indifferentism <coughs> leads logically to atheism. Indifferentism, all religions equal, leads to it atheism. Because indifferentism says all religions are true. And if all religions are true, that and they all contradict each other, and hold different beliefs about Christ, about the Holy Eucharist, about the sacraments, if they all contradict each other, then they're not all equally true, they're all equally false. And if they're all equally false, then religion's for the birds. For old ladies and kids, little children. And it leads logically to atheism. And that's why the Virgin Mary at Fatima said, atheism, communism, will spread everywhere. And now our poor United States, we have become more atheist in our practice than Russia. So we have to pray. Pray for the conversion of our, ourselves, our families, our country. So, um, and also, how, do, how else do we sin against the faith, apostasy, heresy, indifferentism, and by taking part in non-Catholic worship. So for a Catholic to pray in a Protestant service and join in their prayers, however devoutly, it's a mortal sin. It's a grave sin against our Lord Jesus Christ. To, to uh, pray together with Protestants at business meetings, are on the sports field and pray the Protestant prayers 
Those are sins against the faith. And if any kids are on the football team or hockey team, you tell the coach, I'll lead the prayer, and you say a Hail Mary. And the glory be in the sign of the cross, of course. So just do that. And, but you can't participate in false prayers and false worship. Why does a Catholic sin against faith by partaking in non-Catholic worship? A Catholic sins against faith by taking part in non-Catholic worship because he thus professes belief in a religion he knows is false. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. John 14. He says this to Thomas, St. Thomas. So when we pray with false religions, we acknowledge there's another way, another truth, another life than Jesus Christ the King. And then, um, then the sins against hope, which are presumption and despair. A person sins by presumption when he trusts that he can be saved by his own efforts, without God's help, or by God's help without his own efforts. So, presumption uh, is a sin where people, for example, won't pray. They'll go a long time without prayer. And we need to pray every day. Morning prayer is one of the most important prayers of the day. And night prayers too. Uh, it's a mortal sin, says St. Alphonsus, to go a month without prayer. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall, St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10.12. When does a sin of despair take place? A person sins by despair when he deliberately refuses to trust that God will give him the necessary help to save his soul. And this is one of the attacks the devil unleashes on many good souls. They despair because I'm so full of sin, and I fall all the time, and I'm just so weak. But no, God wants us to pray. Ask and you will receive. Seek, you will find. Knock, it will be open to you. He will give the grace if you keep praying. Never ever give up. St. Matthew 27. Then Judas, who betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented and brought, and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned and betrayed innocent blood. And he flung the pieces of silver into the temple and withdrew, and went away and hanged himself with a halter. Judas was foolish. He should have gone to the Virgin Mary. If he went to the foot of the cross, our Lord would have forgiven him. So Judas drowned in his, his despair. Despair is like the sin of a drowning man, and people from the boat throw a buoy or a lifesaver that floats. And it's right there. All he has to do is grab it. But he says, no, no, I'm drowning, I'm, I'm too bad, I, I, that can't help me, it's too late now. <clears throat> and that's foolishness. And, and many priests, sometimes we encounter dying people. I had a 103-year-old man dying. He said, Father, I'm already going to hell, I've lived my long life, I don't need your help. I tried to get him to pray, I tried to get him to make a confession, I tried him to come back to nothing. So I asked the contemplative Carmelites to pray. I asked the contemplative Benedictines to pray. I asked many people to pray for this soul. A week later, he went to confession, communion, and died a holy death. So that's the power of hope. That's the power of prayer. That's the power of prayer of the communion of saints. And then uh, lastly, by which we'll wrap up this catechism, the chief sins against charity. What are they? <coughs> Hatred of God. Remember, this is the worst sin we can commit ever. Hatred of God. And of our neighbor, also, envy, sloth, and scandal. So envy, uh, jealous at others' success, material success, spiritual success, sloth, which includes not just being lazy, but lazy towards God, not praying, not spiritual reading, not striving to live in the state of grace, being putting off confession putting off retreats, putting off the study that you need to do to find out what's wrong with Vatican II, what's wrong with this fake resistance, where is the true faith being taught, who's holding the line of Archbishop Lefebvre. We all have a duty to find this and fight for it and not be lazy about it. And then scandal. Scandal is any word, act, or omission that is in itself evil 
or has the appearance of evil, and which can be of the occasion of another's sin. Scandal may be given either, even, through no, even though no sin follows. A person who has already determined to sin or a person who cannot be led into sin cannot be scandalized. Scandal is direct when a word, act, or omission is intended to lead another into sin. So that's very perverse, to directly lead another into sin, such as seduction or impure speech, impure jokes. St. Alphonsus said, the man who tells impure jokes does the work of over 300 devils. Because if five people hear him, he's made, he could make five people fall into mortal sin. Scandal is indirect when it is foreseen that one's word, act, or omission is likely to be the occasion of another's sin, even though such is not intended. So those are sins against charity. And uh, what is a sacrilege? A person sins by sacrilege when he mistreats sacred persons, places, or things. To mistreat a person consecrated to God in the clerical or religious state of life is a personal sacrilege. The violation of places dedicated to divine worship by the public authority of the church, for example, churches and chapels, is a local sacrilege. The misuse or violation of sacred things, for example, the sacraments, the holy scriptures, objects consecrated are blessed for divine worship or a devotion, chalices, statues, this is a real sacrilege. So if someone takes a chalice like the Freemasons did in um, Mexico during the persecution, they took the chalices and drank their, their dozeki and their coronas out of the chalices. They desecrated those chalices. And of course the Holy Eucharist itself. They have set thy sanctuary ablaze, says Psalm 73. They have profaned the dwelling of thy name on the earth. They said in their hearts, Let us destroy them altogether. Burn ye all God's sanctuaries in the land. And this is Vatican II. It has barbarically destroyed the altars, the faith, our catechisms, the tradition of the church. So that's why we need to fight for the Catholic tradition, and not in the line of wish-wash, like the fake resistance, but the line of Archbishop Lefebvre, with clear teaching and clear condemnations, of the new mass, compromise, the fake resistance, and so forth. And it's about the truth that matters. Names are not so important. The truth matters, and it's important part of truth is to condemn error. It's not enough to tell little Johnny, Johnny, you have to be good and obey the traffic laws, but you have to tell him, you step in the street <coughs> during traffic, and you, don't, you step in the street or intersection and when you're running to get your ball, and uh, I'll, I'm going to spank you. I'm going to pull the belt on you. Okay, yes, yes, I won't do that, I promise. So, anyway, be strong in the faith. We'll close with this. This is the Catechism of the First Commandment. And next week will be the Second Commandment. We'll say a little prayer. That's the bell for Compline. The seminarians are gathering now for the night prayers of the church. O most holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, I adore thee profoundly, and I offer thee the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the earth, in reparation for the insults, sacrileges, and indifference with which he is offended, and through the infinite merits of his most sacred heart, and of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, I beg thee for the conversion of poor sinners. Amen. Sorrowful and Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. Saint Anthony, pray for us. Saint Jerome, pray for us. Saint Catherine of Siena, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.